All right, let me ask everyone to, uh, oh, let me ask everyone to please take their seats. Thank you so much. My name is Tobias Barrington Wolf. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And uh, it's my great pleasure and my great honor to be moderating our panel on, on LGBT equality today. Uh, the panel is sponsored by the firm of Skadden Arps, Slate, Meager, and Flom, to whom we are very grateful. And uh, this is a particularly apt week to be uh, discussing the issue of LGBT equality, what we have accomplished so far, uh, the current state of affairs, and the path ahead. Uh, and we have a, a really very distinguished panel of experts to, to guide us through that discussion. Um, I think that it, the set state of affairs that we find ourselves in today can best be characterized as being in the middle of a fight for formal equality. Um, this is what it looks and feels like to be uh, on a path towards formal equality and very much not there yet. Uh, I was speaking with one of our, uh, one of the panelists uh, just before we started uh, about the progression that we have seen in the couple of decades or decade and a half in my case of work that uh, we've been doing on this issue. It used to be the case that one could, if you were doing this work on LGBT equality, you could name all the cases that had ever been decided pretty much in any American court that bore in any way good or bad, and mo most of them were bad, on the status of LGBT people and of same-sex couples. Because there just wasn't a lot of law out there. And in doing advocacy, one would write briefs in which one would make these beautiful and stirring and ringing arguments and cite some really great law review articles and cite some cases for some very uh, important and profound general principles. But you wouldn't have a lot of actual precedent to cite because there wasn't a heck of a lot out there. And through the work of very dedicated advocates and scholars, some of them sitting to my left <coughs> on this panel, we started winning cases. And we started make, winning legislative fights. And suddenly, we had work that we could, uh, and precedent that we could cite as in support of equal treatment of LGBT people and of same-sex couples beyond simply the sort of broad general principles that had been the bread and butter of doing this work for so long. And there came a point, I think, probably for each one of us on this panel, when we suddenly realized it's kind of like when you have a kid and the kid comes home and suddenly they know words that you didn't teach them, right? And it, suddenly there were cases out there that we didn't know about. And we would find out about cases not because we or the people that we knew were involved in initiating them, but just because they had happened. And suddenly the law was changing in ways that were unexpected. Um, and that's when you know that a movement for formal equal treatment has uh, gotten off the ground. Uh, but we are very much not there yet. Uh, the current state of play in the field of relationship rights uh, is exciting and dynamic, to be sure. There are now five states plus the District of Columbia, where we are right now, uh, where gay couples can get married. There are another eight states uh, as of today, <coughs> indeed as of a couple of weeks ago, where uh, same-sex couples can enter into either civil unions or fully equal, uh, uh, fully substantively equal domestic partnerships. Um, the Defense of Marriage Act, the federal statute which keeps gay couples from being treated equally for any purposes at the federal level, uh, is uh, under attack. And uh, the Obama administration, in a really very important and historic uh, uh, move, has, as I'm sure most of you know, declared that they cannot in good faith and with uh, reasonable constitutional arguments defend this statute, and indeed that anti-gay discrimination requires heightened judicial scrutiny, a, a monumentally important statement by the administration, which has already started to get picked up by federal courts that are being presented with these issues. Uh, but there remain the vast majority of states and the vast majority of people, uh, LGBT people and couples in the United States, who have no relationship rights, who have no family law rights, or very, very few family law rights and relationship rights at the state level, and who still, despite important movement at the federal level, uh, don't have any rights at the federal level. We are in the middle of a dynamic movement, but we are not there yet. Uh, most recently, the, uh, some of you may have read the news coverage, the uh, bankruptcy court for the Central District of California issued a really quite extraordinary opinion uh, in a case in which they were presented with a same-sex couple, a married same-sex couple, who were seeking the protections of uh, Chapter 13 of the Bankruptcy Code as a married couple. And the Bankruptcy Court was called upon to decide whether the Defense of Marriage Act could constitutionally prevent them from having access to that treatment. 
And a judge of the bankruptcy court uh, wrote a really quite uh, powerful analytical uh, answer to that question in which he said no, that DOMA could not constitutionally exclude same-sex couples. There was no good reason, bankruptcy or otherwise, to allow same-sex couples to be treated this way. And in an act which uh, was extraordinary and in some ways perhaps unprecedented, uh, 20 of the 25 members of the Central District of California Bankruptcy Court uh, signed their names in their own hand to this opinion. It, it is a type of, of endorsement of important bankruptcy rulings that bankruptcy courts undertake occasionally on very rare occasion. I think it is probably the first time that a bankruptcy court has ever done this on a constitutional issue that is not fundamentally a bankruptcy issue. And the magnitude of the statement with 20 members of the court signing their names, 20 um, you know, federal, not Article III judges, but federal judges signing their names uh, to this beautifully analyzed opinion, is it is one of those moments where I think the burden of presumption is shifting away from the people who are asking for equality and on to the people who are seeking to resist it. Um, the questions that I think our panel can usefully grapple with are, uh, what is the road ahead looking like? And what is the road ahead looking like both in the fight for formal equality and also importantly, what will come next after formal equality? Or what should we be working towards while we are working towards formal equality? Uh, part of the history of civil rights in the United States is very much one of both the importance but also the limitations of formal equality. Uh, in many respects, people of color in the United States have had formal equality before the law for the better part of half a century. And the story of equality for people of color in the United States is one that is quite imperfectly and incompletely told if all you're focusing on is formal equality. So in the road ahead, what is it that we need to be doing both to uh, continue to promote the fight for formal equality, but also to be thinking strategically and, and intelligently about what we need in addition to formal equality to ensure that the dignity and the aspirations and the safety of LGBT people around the United States are being well attended to. And that is the set of questions, broadly speaking, that I'm hoping my distinguished panelists will be able to talk to us about. Let me quickly introduce you to them, and then I'm going to uh, uh, pose some questions to them. Uh, sitting immediately to my left is Kevin Cathcart. Kevin is the executive director of Lambda Legal Defense and is, I think it is safe to say, a sort of living legend and institution in the field <laughs> of uh, LGBT equality and institutional uh, uh, promotion of LGBT equality. Um, Nancy Polikoff is professor of law at American University Washington College of Law. She is, I dare say, the most important scholarly voice in the country on the question of the family law treatment of uh, same-sex couples and indeed all kinds of non so-called non-traditional families and thinking more expansively than many people often do about what types of structures and support ought to be available to people and to families and to relationships. Um, next to Nancy, we have Evan Wolfson, who is both the founder and the, what is your title, president? President, president of <laughs> Freedom to Marry. Um, Evan is one of the, I think it's safe to say, most visionary litigators in the field of LGBT equality. He has been doing this work uh, since the Hawaii case first burst onto the scene, and he has been one of the most important, not just analytical, but also strategic voices in the field of LGBT equality. Next to Evan, we have Brian Moulton. Brian is the senior legislative counsel for the Human Rights Campaign here in Washington, D.C. He is, in many ways, HRC's voice on the Hill when it comes to legislative efforts to promote LGBT equality and also to resist uh, the kinds of draconian measures that we are seeing now that we have a, uh, a hostile uh, majority voice in uh, the U.S. House of Representatives um, and is a key player in all discussions of uh, long-term sort of longitudinal federal legislative strategy. And finally, on the very end, we have Holning Lau, who's a professor at the University of North Carolina Law School. And Holning is uh, emerging as a very important voice not only in queer theory and <coughs> LGBT equality doctrinally, but also in the intersection of LGBT equality and uh, critical race theory with a very powerful international perspective. And it's my hope that he's going to bring to bear all of those various different areas of expertise today. So let me first pose a question to Evan. Um, Evan, uh, you have been one of the sort of grand strategists of this movement for quite some time. And um, tell me uh, in what ways the current state of 
LGBT equality efforts are uh, conforming to your expectations about how the movement for equality would, un would unfold? And what do you think is coming next? And in particular, what mistakes do you see down the road that we have to avoid making? In, in 30 words? Yeah. Um. <laughs> we have a little more time for yeah. that. We're going to speak for about 50 minutes, and then I'm going to uh, have about a half an hour for questions for you folks, by the way. Well, actually, that's an easier question. I thought you were going to start with what's happening in Albany. So um, <laughs> I figured I would ease into that. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I actually said jokingly to you earlier when we were chatting that I think in general, in, my, in the work, I've been generally right about what's going to happen and wrong about when it's going to happen. And I think that that is really true. Uh, I, I'm going to push back a little bit on your emphasis, Tobias, although there's obviously a lot of legitimacy to it, uh, on formal legal equality. Because in my view, the work that many of us have been doing and are committed to, although one could talk about it as formal equality, there's actually a giant overlap with the achievements in the fight for formal uh, legal e equality, inclusion, freedom, the things I think we're all fighting for, and the cultural and general acceptance that is sort of excluded by that term formal legal equality. And I think the marriage work is a, is a powerful testament to that. When I wrote my law school essentially thesis on why we should have the freedom to marry back in the, um, <laughs> the argument I made, yeah, right. well, I defer. <laughs> <laughs> the, the argument I made then was that we should have this, and it's important to fight for it as a matter of what you would call, and I wasn't scholarly enough to call formal legal equality. It's because it's of all the forms of prejudice and discrimination that people endure, it seems to me the most intolerable is when it's conducted by the government directed at, at any segment of our people, that, that lots of things are terrible, but when the government is the direct discriminator <coughs> fencing out any group, that is just something we all have to stand up and be vigilant against, no matter which group or who it is. And it seemed to me the denial of marriage was a supreme example of that. And I also argued then, and of course believe, that ending the exclusion from marriage, while not the only thing that matters, while not something that will solve every legal or economic, let alone cultural problem, is something that will bring more of the rights and protections and responsibilities that we deserve, that our loved ones need, that our families are entitled to. But I also argued in that paper and continued to believe that the other reason to be fighting for the freedom to marry is that the work we would do, the conversation we would have in engaging in this very powerful vocabulary of marriage would tug everything else along. It would change people's understanding of who gay people are. It would change people's understanding of what marriage is, of what equality means, of, of, of what families look like. And although one could tackle any piece of those in any number of different ways, I felt that the marriage work, while advancing where we need to be legally, in marriage and across the board, would also advance where we need to be culturally and in full inclusion and acceptance. And, and I believe, others may disagree, I believe that's exactly what we've seen. When the Supreme Court in the Hardwick case, for example, in 1986, dismissed our, our right, and for that matter, all Americans' right, to be free in their bedrooms to make intimate choices, it did so by disclaiming any connection between homosexuality and, as they put it, marriage, procreation, and child raising. And what we then went on to do in the next chapter of our movement was show that there is indeed every connection between homosexuality, gay people, and child raising, procreation, and yes, marriage. And by claiming that vocabulary, we, we set the stage for overturning Hardwick, which on its face was not a marriage case, but the marriage conversation that unfolded in the, sec in the succeeding 17 years after Hardwick laid the groundwork for Lawrence and the attainment of, a, of an American right to private uh, conduct in the home, sexual intimacy, and personal choices and personal freedom. Uh, likewise, the marriage work in, in the recent days has led to, as you pointed out rightly, the Obama administration's historic embrace of heightened scrutiny <coughs> for sexual orientation. Not, not just marriage, not just DOMA, but saying that from now on, in the view of the Justice Department and the President, 
the Constitution says that <coughs> discrimination against lesbian, gay, and bisexual people has to be presumed to be unconstitutional, not presumed to be okay. That was a giant step forward, and it was propelled by the conversation about marriage. And in my view, I use the word conversation pointedly because it's not only the legal work, the legislative battles, the legal fights, the, the electoral campaigns in which this work is unfolding, but it's very much the conversation. It's claiming that vocabulary. And that rich engagement of the American people, indeed people around the world, in this vocabulary of marriage has transformed the landscape on which we very much continue to have to fight. And that, that is what I envisioned would happen. It certainly takes a long time to make this happen, but again, if you look at any other social justice or historic movement, ours is going very quickly. And it's painful day to day. It's certainly a large chunk out of our social life, but in the sweep of history, to have gone from, for example, 26% of the American people believing gay people should have the freedom to marry in 1996, when we were doing the Hawaii case and fighting against so-called DOMA in Congress, to now, just 15 years later, polls, six of them, showing 52, 53% of the American people favoring the freedom to marry nationwide, literally doubling in 15 years, that's a movement. Well, then let me ask you to put some uh, sort of meat on the bones of, of this story of progress. Um, how much do you see the shift in attitudes that Evan just described being driven by what courts are doing and saying? How much do you see it being reflected in what courts are doing and saying? And, and where are we in terms of that doctrinal and status evolution for LGBT people and for gay couples? And of course, the T part of LGBT often finds uh, itself traveling a somewhat different path, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, when it comes to, to formal legal equality. I think there's been incredible movement and progress with the doctrinal tests um, that are involved in LGBT equality. As you mentioned, um, it was not so long ago that there wasn't that much precedent that we could turn to, but um, in recent years, that has changed quite a bit. So for example, there was virtually no precedent that we could look to until fairly recently that sexual orientation um, it should be considered a suspect or quasi-suspect status, right? Uh, but in recent years, California, Connecticut, Iowa have all found sexual orientation to be either suspect or quasi-suspect. We have the Eric Holder's letter, um, the tax court opinion that you mentioned, as well as Perry versus Schwarzenegger, all suggesting, arguing that sexual orientation is either suspect or quasi-suspect. And that's a huge difference to, um, let's say, contrast that situation with the case of um, Anderson versus King County from Washington State. I think that was around two, 2008, something like that, where the court there said no, you know, sexual orientation is not a suspect or quasi-suspect status, and they provided this long string site of <coughs> court opinions that had held that sexual orientation is not suspect or quasi-suspect. Now those cases were old. Many of these older cases cited Bowers versus Hardwick for support, right? Um, but between then and now, it, you know, um, there's really been this burgeoning of uh, precedent that we could look to now to argue that sexual orientation is suspect or quasi-suspect. And I think as a matter of doctrine, it's right. These courts have gotten the legal test correct, right? In particular, how these courts have looked at the relevance of immutability um, and political powerlessness to determine whether or not a status should be considered suspect or quasi-suspect. These courts have taken a broader definition of immutability, um, looking um, not to whether or not sexual orientation is necessarily um, biological, um, but whether or not it goes against um, basic understandings of human dignity to um, require or ask people to change their sexual orientation, right? Um, uh, as for political powerlessness, these courts have taken a broader understanding about what it means for a group to be politically um, uh, burdened in terms of power, and I think that's correct because if we took a narrow understanding of political power, um, statuses like gender and um, race would also be susceptible to the argument that they should no longer be um, su suspect or quasi-suspect statuses, and we don't see courts turning in that direction. So I think that as a matter of uh, 
maintaining fidelity to precedent, right, in terms of other areas of equality, these courts are getting it right. Um, another area of legal doctrine that I think has developed in a um, very positive way in these marriage cases is the fact that there has been a rebirth of the sex discrimination argument, and I think that's terrific. Um, we saw in Perry versus Schwarzenegger, as well as the tax court decision, um, judges saying that sexual orientation discrimination is also a type of sex discrimination. I think that's correct as a formal matter, but also because uh, from a very substantive standpoint, right, it reminds us that marriage has historically been a very sexist institution, right? S marriage was defined by very rigid roles for the man and the woman, and in many regards, the fact that sex still matters as a threshold requirement for entering into marriage, that's a relic of marriage is sexist past, right? And I think um, it's important to illuminate the connection between sex discrimination and sexual orientation discrimination. Um, I think it's important for coalition building. Um, and uh, I think it's important to remind folks that outside of the courtroom, right, when we look at the arguments that opponents of marriage equality are making, so many of their arguments are based on sexist arguments, right? The idea that men and women need to come together because they complement each other in certain ways and that children need a male and female role model. That all presupposes that there's a particular way for to be a man and a particular way to be a woman, that you know, a man parents in a particular way and a woman parents in another particular way, and therefore you know, um, it's only these different sex couples that can provide the optimal environment for child rearing. The social science does not support that. Um, and I think, you know, illuminating that point is very helpful because I think many, many Americans, um, once they see that sexism in those arguments, um, it resonates with them. Yeah, I have to say, I, one of the great sources of personal pleasure for me in reading the bankruptcy opinion um, from the other week is that the very first uh, American court to hold and, and uh, offer a thorough analysis of the proposition that anti-gay discrimination provokes heightened or strict judicial scrutiny was a panel of the Ninth Circuit in a challenge to the anti-gay military policy that preceded the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy in a case called Perry versus, uh, excuse me, Walken, Perry Watkins versus U.S. Army. And that opinion didn't survive. It actually transmuted into something else in the unbanked process in the Ninth Circuit. But it was written by a judge named William Norris, who uh, I had the great privilege of clerking for for his last three months on the bench. And the bankruptcy opinion cited Judge Norris's opinion, um, sort of reaching back into what is now the kind of back in the day precedent. Uh, it's so nice to have back in the day precedent. Um, <laughs> um, Kevin, let me um, take Holning's uh, observations and ask you to uh, both educate us about where litigation is happening in LGBT issues in the United States, not just on relationship rights, but more broadly. And you know how, uh, how we need to be thinking about making choices with respect to resource allocation, choices with respect to uh, you know, strategic uh, selection of issues that we think are going to push forward the larger <laughs> goal of having courts embrace a, a sort of full uh, you know, doctrinal and, and, and principled approach to LGBT equality. Um, what, what, is, what is the landscape looking like and what is strategic thinking looking like in the area of litigation today? Sure. Well, I guess one thing I would start by saying is that there is litigation going on on LGBT issues everywhere in this country, but it varies dramatically regionally as to what is possible to get into court, uh, what is possible to win, and what the challenges are that people are, are facing perhaps the most on the ground. And, you know, when we talk about formal legal equality or, or the road ahead, uh, it's one thing that I worry about is that the road ahead is longer than a lot of uh, people who are very involved in the movement like to think that it is. A lot of us live in bubbles. I live in, you know, I live in New York City, which is a bubble. Uh, I'm sure that many of you live in a handful of cities uh, or in academic environments or in progressive law <laughs> firms or whatever, uh, where it is easier to think that we are overall further ahead than we are. Um, and also because of the way that the media plays stuff, I mean, you could read the papers very closely and think that marriage is really all that's out there because it gets 
uh, an enormous amount of attention. You know, it deserves an enormous amount of attention, but it doesn't uh, solve all of the problems for people across the country. Um, there's an enormous amount of family law work that's being done uh, in places like the Midwest and the South. I'm not going to go into that because I think Nancy will talk about it much more. Uh, very challenging for people in relationships raising children uh, in many parts of the country where adoption is for various reasons not an option for them and how you can maintain relationships. Uh, uh, workplace discrimination is still rampant. Um, at Lambda Legal we have help desks at all five of our offices. We have an 800 number. We get over 6,000 calls a year from people looking for assistance. Every year since we have been keeping track, uh, employment discrimination has been the number one thing that people call us about. And uh, there are far too many states in which we unfortunately have no good answer for people. If you're not a public employee, uh, there is nothing really to work with. And so um, we need uh, well, we need ENDA. We need <laughs> national legislation because many of the states that I'm that I'm referencing, uh, I can't really look far enough ahead to think. Well, when do I believe the Texas legislature is going to pass the state civil rights bill that provides employment protection? I, I try to be optimistic and far-reaching, but that goes beyond uh, my capacity. And there's a whole <laughs> number of other states that I could put on that list. And so, uh, so I think we need to. Uh, when we're talking about formal legal equality, just remember, you know, the people who are not necessarily represented in this room or at this conference and, and the challenges that they have. Uh, this is particularly true, uh, as was said earlier, uh, for transgender people. It is particularly true for people with HIV, uh, which continues to be in, in large parts a gay disease in this country. And uh, I have trouble picturing how we can have uh, anything that looks like full equality when 53% of the people who zero convert every year in this country are men who have sex with men. Right now, 48% of people living with HIV in this country are gay or bisexual men, and because we're zero converting faster than other people, those lines are going to cross probably in the next two years or so, and we're going to be a majority. This is particularly true among young uh, gay or bisexual men. It's particularly true in the African American community particularly true in places like Washington, D.C., which has uh, a zero prevalence rate that rivals places in uh, the underdeveloped world where treatments are not available. So we also deal with a lot of police abuse in places around the country, uh, selective enforcement, police stings, people get arrested, lives are destroyed. Uh, again, you don't hear much about it in New York, but you hear a lot about it when you get further afield. So there is an, an entire range of other work that needs to be done. Um, it was a, one of the things that was a great thing in the past week or so was the uh, Department of Education uh, encouraging schools again about, um, about gay-straight alliances. Uh, there's an enormous explosion of gay-straight alliances, like from zero to, I don't know, untold thousands and thousands in the last 10 years, but let's not think that that covers all of the schools in America or that even that schools that have gay-straight alliances uh, necessarily are reaching all of the students who need them or that school administrators are doing everything they need to do to stop harassment and violence against kids who are or are perceived to be uh, either gay or transgender or just somehow you know, not uh, traditional enough. So. Um, I think we have enormous challenges, and I guess one of the things that I worry about in this is uh, as we win more and more in places like California or New England or New York, uh, and we get some of the big things out of the way, how do we keep enough people engaged in the game to do the massive cleanup operations that are necessary to bring uh, the, the vast geography that is the rest of the country along? on so many issues that we may never be able to make sexy enough for the front page of newspapers, uh, but that impact so many people's day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, let me a ask you a quick follow-up, if sure. I could, um, and also offer the, the, the friendly suggestion that cleanup operations might not be the most felicitous turn of phrase in <laughs> describing <laughs> efforts to se secure equality for our brothers and sisters in Missouri and in Texas and, and other states of the Union. but. Um, uh, a lot of, I think, what you just laid out very much uh, is an extension of Evan's observation about how, in at least the marriage arena, the work on, on formal, formally equal legal status 
has a, a, a driving uh, effect in changing cultural attitudes, in changing cultural expectations, in changing um, the, the presumptions that people bring to not just their relationship with government, but indeed their relationship with these issues when it comes to you know, what constitutes a family or what kinds of knee-jerk, not very well thought out hostility am I allowed to express and, and what do I have to censor myself a little bit or, or, or check myself a little bit about before I just blurt it out. Um, and I think that Evan makes a very powerful case that in the arena of relationship rights, there has been this symbiotic relationship between these two, uh, these two <coughs> processes of development. You make the very important point that not only are there a whole host of other areas of human endeavor where uh, people need assistance and protection in employment, in civilian police relations, right? But those are also areas where the, the uh, establishment of formal legal protections is an incredibly important first step. But you know, we have over 45 years of practice under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and we certainly don't have you know, formal legal equality, uh, practical, we have formal legal equality, but we don't have practical equality. We, we don't have pay equity. We don't have a sensible approach to uh, a disparate impacts um, upon disfavored groups in the workplace. And those battles continue, and those are as much battles about people's expectations in the workplace as they are about the details of formal legal doctrine. So do you think that there is a similar symbiotic relationship that is going to happen in the establishment of formal legal protections in the workplace, in police-civilian relations, whatever it might be? Or do you think that we have a bigger project there even than we have had in relationship rights when it comes to changing not just the legal mechanisms available to people, but also the, the shared expectations and the shared sort of cultural norms that are going to define people's day-to-day -day equality? Well, I, I guess so to the first part of your question, I want to say yes, but. I mean, I, I completely agree with Evan. I think that, that you know, changing people's notions about marriage and bringing us in state by state uh, to a much fuller kind of recognition of the truths of our lives and to equality is an enormous game changer in terms of both how people in the LGBT community view ourselves and our expectations and how people outside view us and our expectations. So I think that that's critically critical and it makes a huge difference. I think the challenge uh, is, I'm not sure if I should call it a disconnect or a lag time, but the, there's some sort of a, of a disconnect and it has a long lag time about the change of cultural attitudes um, sort of translated into state legislatures and the passage of other kinds of legislation or how it translates in, you know, however it is that things trickle up through to the courts uh, in whatever rarefied air judges are breathing and, and what changes uh, their positions. And so uh, I think that the marriage battle has had a huge impact, you know, inside and outside the community um, but as we see, and I guess we'll eventually talk about Albany, but even in Albany, <laughs> okay. um, which you know I used to think was the worst state capital in the world, but it still has 72 hours to redeem itself, um, <laughs> the, the, it, is, it takes a long time. Um, I, said, I didn't guarantee it. I said it has, it. Uh, the clock is ticking. But it takes a long time for this stuff to trickle up and to translate into those other kinds of changes. And so... Uh, that's part of what I was saying when I worry about keep, keeping people in the game. If there's too big of a disconnect between you know, large parts of the very visible and involved LGBT community thinking, okay, well, we're this far ahead because we've got all of this, and yet you know, we can't marshal the votes that we need in state after state after state, not just on marriage, but on employment protections, on family law, on schools, on a whole range of things. That lag time is a very frustrating time to live in. Uh, it feels frustrating for those of us who live in the bubble. I think I can assure you from what we hear at our health desk, it's far more frustrating for the people who aren't living in the bubble uh, because they're living in it all the time. It's a little theoretical for some of us. It's real for them. And so um, how we translate that into the kind of political action when, the, when it's wonderful when the polls are on our side, but um, in the end, the votes are you know, more important in some ways than the polls. Yeah. Um, Nancy, um, <clears throat> help us understand what this process of development looks like 
in the field of family law and in the field of parentage. And, and in particular, I mean, one of the many things that's been um, so important about your work is um, challenging what are sometimes easy or even lazy decisions that the rest of us make about how to frame the questions that we ought to be asking. And so uh, help us understand what's going on in the sort of day-to-day -day lives of parents and families and children right now. And in what ways are we potentially asking the wrong questions? Thanks. Can I invite the people in the back who want to sit down to come up to the front? There's actually plenty of seats here, and um, you should feel free to sit. Um, well, when you started off, uh, Tobias, by talking about cases that just happen, that aren't cases um, brought by national gay rights organizations or thought out as part of a large strategy, um, family law is the perhaps the area that um, in which that is most true because we, like all families, just live our lives and then run into some legal issue that uh, comes up that brings us into the courts. And there's a, um, a, a number of different ways I could uh, tackle your question. Um, I, I tend to think the question that we should be asking is about um, how we can get the law to recognize and protect the families that we actually form and not have a preconceived notion of what those families will look like. So in the marriage litigation, for example, we have families that look like what a heterosexual family with children might look like in a, a sort of typical um, nuclear family form, and that makes sense in the context of the marriage litigation, but does not represent all of the ways in which um, LGBT people are actually having children and seeking to organize the ways in which they raise those children. Um, and the issue comes up in, an, in a number of contexts. Um, the, one of the um, very exciting decisions to come out this year came actually from the Arkansas Supreme Court, um, demonstrating that you can't entirely predict um, good and bad states based on region. You can a lot, but not entirely. <laughs> so we have the, the, um, the Arkansas Supreme Court um, m virtually immediately after oral argument, ruling that the ban on allowing anyone living with a non-marital partner to adopt a child was a violation of the Arkansas Constitution on liberty grounds. Um, and and uh, you know a discussion essentially of the right to be in a non-marital conjugal relationship and the way in which that Arkansas uh, law violated that. And one of the most important things about that Arkansas case is, m I think many of you probably do remember, but for those of you who don't, the way that became law was through an initiative. So it was a public vote on who could adopt children and a public vote to deny the right to adopt, not based on sexual orientation, but based on living with a non-marital partner, gay or straight. And, and I do think um, there's a very real possibility that we'll be facing other initiatives challenging uh, adoption rights in other jurisdictions. Um, I think most of you probably know that Florida right now is allowing um, gay men and lesbians to adopt children even though the ban remains um, on the books because it was declared unconstitutional by a state intermediate appeals court not appealed by the last administration um, in Florida and there has been a change and, and sort of people are, um, are, are looking at Florida to see what will happen in that direction. Meanwhile, an enormous number of uh, gay men and lesbians have adopted children since literally the day that judgment went into effect because as you might imagine, there was a lot of child rearing going on that um, wasn't being um, fully recognized there. Uh, so the issues that, that come up in that context can be framed a little bit differently than a notion of um, formal equality. And certainly in the family parenting recognition area, um, I do want to stress in a sense the, the way in which child rearing 
um, it comes up in the context of the marriage issue, which is complex because, of course, it is the parenting issue that is most, it's children who are most often used as the reason to deny same-sex couples um, the right to marry, whether it's the children that gay people are raising or actually the children that heterosexuals are um, raising and the enormous amount of anxiety um, that those uh, parents have about the impact on children. But um, there's another uh, perhaps less talked about uh, problem that we're seeing emerge a little bit in jurisdictions that are actually friendly to um, gay equality and even have relationship recognition, which is that we're seeing a phenomenon that I've called the new illegitimacy. So all of you learned that um, it was unconstitutional to discriminate against children born outside of marriage and that um, classifications based on so-called illegitimacy are clearly entitled to heightened constitutional um, scrutiny. And yet um, we have Massachusetts the first state that allowed same-sex couples to marry, where when you, when a couple has, a lesbian couple has a child together, if they are married, the child has two parents from the beginning, and if they're not married, the child has one parent, and we have two very bad um, appeals court decisions in Massachusetts denying parental status rights and responsibilities to a non-biological mother, one of which basically says if they'd been married, the child would have had two parents. Now, they, that particular couple couldn't have been married at the time um, that their child was born, but by the time the court decided the case, um, that was the law in Massachusetts, and there was a, a, a very troubling case from the New York Court of Appeals um, this year in which the court said that a, a, if a lesbian couple has a child together, the child has two parents if that couple has a formalized relationship recognition status, and in that case, they had been in a civil union in Vermont. And the court said that's what makes this um, non-biological mother, a parent. So presumably a married couple, a civil union couple, a couple from a state recognizing comprehensive domestic partnership, those children have two parents. But in the absence of that formalized status, the child only has one parent. And I think that a court, because of the emphasis on marriage equality, I actually think the New York Court of Appeals felt really just fine about themselves, saying that this is what made the uh, person who that child knew very well as a parent, that's what made her a legal parent, not all of the years in which she had raised the child as a parent. That counted for nothing explicitly. So again, in New York, uh, uh, same-sex couples, the, the, the child of a same-sex couple has a different status that's based on whether the, the parents are um, married or not. And my fear is, um, and I, I'm sure everybody on this panel thinks that's the wrong decision. I don't have any doubt in my mind about that. But a marriage equality lens can have very real-world consequences. And considering that children of different sex couples are not supposed to be treated differently based on whether their parents are married or not. Um, I think we need to pay very careful attention that in the states where there is marriage equality or other formal recognition, we don't wind up with two classes of children based on whether uh, their parents marry. And sometimes seeing through a marriage equality lens um, leads to uh, different advocacy options that are being considered and um, taken, and my lens is always going to be uh, recognition of the families that same-sex couples actually form. And one last thing I'll say is that um, in the realm of family law litigation that goes on uh, around the country, it is a very common scenario now to have a couple have a child together and have them split up and have one parent who's the biological parent essentially try to remove the non-biological parent from the child's life. And um, that is a common scenario. Cases are happening all over the country in that regard um, with mixed results. And again, not always in the most predictable states. So for example, New York, absent formalized 
recognition or an actual second parent adoption. The child only has one parent. In Kentucky, we had a really good opinion last year that basically said, it looks to me like this child has two mothers. We're going to count the child as having two mothers. It was sort of a court saying, I'm looking at this family. This is what I'm seeing. And that's how I'm going to call the result in the case. One thing you can be sure of is the Alliance Defense Fund and Liberty Council will always um, <coughs> represent biological parents against non-biological parents in these cases. And we see them doing this all around the country, taking the position that parentage should be based on biology and anything other than that um, should be completely um, rejected and is a threat to the well-being of children in a number of um, a number of ways in which they articulate. So I think this is sometimes under the radar screen, but basically a biological parent can call up one of those two organizations and find representation um, or amicus support, whichever they want to have um, in those kinds of cases. Yeah, and uh, Nancy's uh, uh, reminder to us, which is so important that, I mean, we have gotten phenomenal decisions from the high courts in states like Georgia, and Kentucky and Montana and Alaska and we have gotten terrible decisions in states like New York and Washington. Uh, you know, the, the, the regional bias that I think creeps into civil rights work a little casually has not often been borne out in the receptivity of uh, uh, courts around the country, many of whom have, uh, many of which have long traditions of you know, a, an independent and robust state judiciary, uh, and many of which don't, but, but many of which do. Uh, there are many opportunities for, for advocacy around the country that, are not, uh, that don't map onto the opportunities for legislative advocacy necessarily. Um, here's what I want to do. Um, I'm going to ask Brian to take uh, the sort of whole range of issues that we have just put on the table in the last 45 minutes, or wow. okay. as, as much of them as you can sure. wrap your That's arms around. And you're a tall guy, so you can wrap your arms pretty broadly. Um, and help us understand what has happened and what, more to the point, what uh, prospects for further progress there are on the federal level, both uh, on the administrative and executive side, um, and also more problematically in the present environment on the legislative side. Um, and I'm going to wrap up asking Evan if he can give us um, his best understanding of the current state of affairs in Albany with respect to the possibility of enacting marriage equality in the state of New York. And following Evan's wrap up, that'll leave us about half an hour and then I'm, I'm going to invite you folks to ask questions. And just so you'll be thinking ahead, um, if you can raise your hands and when I call on you, come to one of the microphones that we've got so that we can get your voice on. You're all, you all will be recorded uh, and so that we can make sure that your question is, is able to be heard on the recording. That would be great. Brian? Sure, sure. Well, that's no small task, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, well, I think the first thing I wanted to emphasize is despite you know, the, the framing that we're not in the best shape when it comes to the Hill these days, which is, is quite fair, um, we shouldn't uh, discount what has been accomplished on the, on the federal federal legislative front uh, in the last couple of years. I mean, we went uh, from having no affirmative uh, LGBT inclusive law, a federal law on the books with the exception of a, uh, a, a mandate, uh, a voluntary actually uh, requirement of reporting of sexual orientation based hate crimes data uh, to having uh, uh, a law that uh, includes gender identity uh, in the federal code for the first time, uh, robustly protecting uh, LGBT people against uh, hate violence uh, on the federal level. Um, and of course, um, we have uh, the first repeal of a, an affirmatively anti-LGBT uh, federal law in the offing. I won't say it's repealed because it's not yet, um, but um, very much uh, on its way to being off the books. And uh, those two happening in the in the last Congress um, after uh, many, many Congresses of, of no progress in terms of, you know, getting us across the finish line on a piece of legislation, um, I think is not something that we should uh, take lightly, both as a, uh, an accomplishment for the community, but also speaking to some of the issues that have been raised about um, helping the people outside of these bubbles uh, and, uh, and also sort of helping uh, change the way that individuals are still interacting um, in the communities, um, particularly on the, say, the, the, the police uh, front. Um, we now have law enforcement all over the country being, being trained as to what is a gender nonconformity based hate crime. 
Um, and I don't think that's something we would have expected the Tulsa PD, for instance, to be talking about, um, you know, even five years ago. And I think we uh, can't underestimate um, we shouldn't underestimate the, the impact that's going to have on sort of the practical interactions people uh, have uh, in small communities um, and the fact that the law is going to provide the opportunity for federal resources to come into play um, to deal with some of these you know, horrible hate crimes in places uh, that, that don't get the attention that they should, um, uh, that there's actually going to be some real you know, on the ground positive practical change for individuals on the basis of that law. Um, and regarding the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal, you know, once we have open service uh, and LGB individuals serving openly, acknowledging their service, being honored for their service, um, being seen as sacrificing uh, for their nation, I think that too is going to have uh, really cultural ramifications that we can't even begin to understand right now. Uh, so I don't want us to walk away thinking, oh, we had a little bit of a good time with, you know, two democratically controlled chambers and, uh, and now it's, it's back to the bad old days without r acknowledging what that last Congress really uh, was, which was a tremendous advance. Um, and I think the votes themselves reflecting how much things are shifting on the issues in terms of that political divide. Um, you know, we had 35 Republicans uh, in the House vote for the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal bill um, and, and eight in the Senate um, and numbers that we just have never seen before in terms of support from that party. So um, I do wanna, wanted to emphasize that and also emphasize that both of those were um, decade, well, a decade plus in the making on, on both fronts. So. Um, uh, acknowledging that, uh, as, as Kevin pointed out, getting the votes on these issues on the Hill, um, you know, has been, you know, a struggle and, and it remains one. Um, but I also wanted to touch quickly on the fact that the Hill and its problems uh, aside, there's been a lot of accomplishment in the administrative realm um, since the Obama administration started. Um, and while it doesn't always get a lot of attention or it, uh, the individual changes are seen as somewhat um, minimal, um, I believe the blogs like to call them crumbs. Um, Cinderella crumbs, I believe is the official term because poof, at the end of the administration, they turn into a pumpkin or something. I'm mixing my metaphors. But um, <laughs> but I did want to say, say that a lot of these changes, I think, um, speak to sort of three different themes that I have raised, been raised uh, over the course of the panel, one of which is you know, changing, actually changing the law, changing these legal standards. And I think, um, you know, as everyone has mentioned, the Attorney General's letter and the, or, and the administration's newfound position on the defense of DOMA is a tremendous, uh, tremendous example uh, of that. Um, but there's also a lot uh, else out there that I think it is, uh, is in that vein, um, particularly around gender identity. So we've seen the administration um, identify changing slowly and quietly um, agency uh, EEO policies to move gender identity into um, the, uh, under the umbrella of sex protections under, uh, under federal law for those uh, employees. Um, without getting into the uh, mind numbingness of uh, federal civil service law, um, sexual orientation is protected in a, in a much less robust way. Um, and so really um, the administration stepping in in this context as a, you know, sort of the HR department and saying, this understanding of Title VII and federal sex discrimination protections, you know, is what we're applying to this, you know, uh, body of employees who happen to, in fact, be uh, the largest employer uh, in in the country, um, is really, I think, going to help move the jurisprudence along um, in the direction it's been going around Title VII for for transgender workers, and and I think we shouldn't um, underestimate that, and not just applying that idea in the context of their employment practices, but also um, the many enforcement uh, uh, functions that different uh, departments uh, serve in terms of enforcing federal non-discrimination laws that already cover sex. So uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, talking about its enforcement of the Fair Housing Act um, and its sex discrimination uh, protections being inclusive of, of transgender people. Um, and there are many more opportunities to move that along in, in the enforcement context as well. Um, and I think 
to the point about, you know, we haven't gotten as far as we need to in a lot of places in this country, I also think many of these um, uh, administrative changes are, are touching the, the lives of those individuals outside of the, uh, the major metropolitan areas. Um, and also speaking to the kind of cultural change, uh, you know, beyond just formal equality, um, that, that's also important to, you know, to what we're all trying to accomplish. And I think a few examples of that, um, obviously the hospital visitation regulations that were very prominently um, advertised uh, and I think you know covered by the the mainstream media um, are, are really going to have a, a significant practical impact on, on you know LGBT families in in their their various forms um, when they're interfacing uh, with the healthcare system. But it's also you know the federal government sending out guidance, information, training to individuals in these hospitals, Medicare and Medicaid participant hospitals that are of course basically every hospital in America. Exposing you know individuals in in all of those places uh, to the realities that these families are going to be walking through their door, um, particularly in some in some very difficult times, and that their understanding of what you know the appropriate approach to dealing with um, the visitation question, um, and we'll, we're going to likely see some forthcoming further guidance around people's healthcare decision making processes um, that they should be thinking about our community. Um, when they're uh, serving that function in these in these medical facilities, and I, I think that's that you know could have some significant uh, impact on on cultural change, um, and there's several other examples of that. Um, in the Department of Labor issued guidance around uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act and coverage for. Um, individuals acting uh, as a parent. Um, it wasn't particularly legally revolutionary, the statute says in loco parentis, the FMLA statute, um, but the fact that that guidance goes out to you know, the HR departments that deal with the FMLA in employers across this country, again, slowly you know, talking to these individuals that when you're thinking about family leave, these are families you should be thinking about. And I, and I do think we, you know, as much as that's a very, you know, a small step, an administrator's interpretation on a website uh, at DOL that is probably not read by a lot of people, you know, beyond people like me, but, um, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I think you, we, in the aggregate, so many of these changes are really going to be speaking to um, talking about uh, our families and, and LGBT individuals in all of these range of contexts in which, you know, as a practical matter, we're, we're still experiencing discrimination. Um, and the last thing that, that I would mention um, uh, is that uh, there's also some, you know, things that aren't really changing the law or really uh, changing policy, but are bringing attention to the issues that LGBT people face, um, you know, in, in all of these areas. Um, the Institute of Medicine at HHS issued a very comprehensive report about uh, LGBT health issues, and one, I think one of the most important findings they had was, uh, their, their directive was, tell us at the National Institutes of Health, other places we should do research on LGBT health issues. And the conclusion of the IOM was like, we can't tell you how to do more research because nobody does any research or data collection, so we can't really tell you what the problems are. We know there are problems, but uh, it's hard to answer the question posed to us because there's been such ignorance about these issues. Um, similarly, you know, the census uh, is going to, to release uh, unmodified uh, the data around married or same-sex couples who identify as married on the census. Um, and we've already seen from the last census and the tremendous work of the folks at the Williams Institute, Gary Gates particularly, um, the critical importance of just being able to say, look at all of these gay people that are out there. Um, and being able to now say, you know, look at them and this is the way they have, um, you know, characterized their relationships. Um, I think we can't underestimate the what the, the consequences of the, the administration's decision to change that approach will have in our ability to just talk about you know, the reality of the, the scope of who is being impacted um, by these inequalities that we've all been talking about. So um, at that, I'll... Yeah, and I just have to say, picking up on, on uh, the theme of Brian's uh, overview, uh, you know, a lot of the media and press attention and a lot of the frustration uh, of uh, LGBT folks about the pace of change on equality issues tends to focus on big ticket legislative items, right? And those are incredibly important and it is appropriate to be focusing on them and appropriate to be pushing very hard on Congress and on the administration to get them done and it was very disappointing that we didn't get a fully inclusive end of this past uh, legislative session, this past Congress. But the, the way in which the business of government on a day-to-day -day basis is just uh, being utterly transformed and has I think already irrevocably been utterly transformed 
in the visibility and the legibility and in the the attention to the existence and the day-to-day, the, -day, uh, the details of the day-to-day -day lives of LGBT people is, is not to be underestimated. I mean, this is, if we passed every big ticket legislative item tomorrow, this is the work that we would have to be doing to translate formal legal <coughs> equality into, you know, practical and concrete changes in people's lives. And, uh, you know, it is not a, a uh, uh, it's not a substitute for getting the big ticket items done, but uh, if anything, I think that uh, we, broadly speaking, have not done a good enough job in talking about the significance of changing the way the government interfaces with its citizens, and that is a lot of the work that I think Brian has just described. Um, Evan, can you give us, uh, I saved this for last because I didn't want to <coughs> kind of crowd out all other topics. Can you give us, as concisely as possible, um, uh, your understanding of the state of play in the state of New York right now, and um, I will start taking questions from people, uh, perhaps start formulating them as Evan is giving, him, giving us his overview. <laughs> well, the very concise way to t say it is it's extraordinarily nerve-wracking and tense, and it's not a done deal, and it's not done until it's done, and we are very, very hopeful that we are going to win the freedom to marry in New York soon, but it's not done until it's done, and we have to keep working at it. That's concise. <laughs> you, you didn't let me turn on my device, so I don't have any more immediate thing to say, but that's really where it is. I can talk about the state of the play, what the fault lines are, but that is that's real, That is where we are. Well, and Very hopeful. Tell us if Call you would, um, another maybe 45 seconds, because I think a lot of folks in the room might not know. Um, how much time is there left in the legislative session? What, what is the... Uh, the best understanding of the vote count versus the question of whether the thing is going to come up for a vote. Just give us that right. sort of primer. Right. So I, I think most people who are following this know that where we where we are is the governor has been an extraordinary champion of the Freedom to Marry bill. He has put it in. It's strong. It's clear. It's good. The assembly has now passed it for the fourth <coughs> time in the last several years. It's now in front of the New York State Senate. The New York State Senate defeated the marriage bill a couple years ago. And the, the work now is to call our senators, keep the work engaging, to have the senators vote for the freedom to marry. The wrinkle in it, as Tobias just alluded to, is that under the normal practice, and I hesitate to use either of those two words when it comes to <laughs> Albany, the controlling caucus, the party that controls, typically decides whether it will allow a bill to even come to a vote, regardless of whether the votes are there or not. And often that's shaped by how that caucus, that conference, Republican or Democrat, in this case now Republican by one vote, the majority, they, they are deciding whether they will allow this to come to a vote even if, and I'll just say if to be careful, even if the votes are there. And of course in the last several days, as everyone has undoubtedly followed, all but one non Ruben Diaz Democrat, has come out in support of the freedom to marry. And two Republicans have gone on record publicly as saying they will vote for the freedom to marry. And we obviously have been working very, very hard in coalition with the Pride Agenda, Human Rights Campaign, Log Cabin, Republicans, Marriage Equality New York, the governor, and others in this mighty united effort to, to make sure we have those votes. And the question is, will the, ma will the majority conference allow it to come to a vote? There's a lot of wrangling going on. Everybody's been following that over the last excruciating several hours. <laughs> and the hope is, indeed, that there will be a vote soon. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Uh, yeah, please, if you can. Thank you very much for uh, this discussion. Uh, I'm a student at University of North Carolina School of Law, so we're happy to have Professor Lau talking to us about these issues. Um, I have a very fundamental question, um, and that is the LGBT movement includes the B and the T, and that's something that you don't really hear that much about, or I, I have, I'm not aware of any litigation pending on, on the um, bisexual and transgender and um, transsexual uh, category of that, and I'm wondering, I don't know the history about how the, those two uh, groups of the movement were included, and and why, and how that how those interface with one another. So that was my question. That's a great question. Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> I mean, I, I have the privilege of not of not having to take some of the tough questions because I'm the moderator. 
<laughs> Nancy, you know the history. Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think Kevin can do it. All right, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, right. and you have a case. To well, there, there actually is a good deal of litigation on transgender issues. Um, I don't think that there is much litigation on specifically bisexual issues, although whenever they're, you know, when bisexuals are involved in any of the kinds of cases that we've been talking about, the media and the courts see them as gay. And so it does not mean that all of the people that we have talked about who have been plaintiffs, whether from the marriage cases to the family law cases to any of the employment or other stuff that I'm talking about, uh, there are lots of bisexuals sort of hidden in the hills there, but they, as soon as they go to court, the issue is about the gay side of the line, not the straight side of the line, and so it sort of disappears. I don't think we're ever going to see a big body of, of law or work uh, that is seen as specifically bisexual. There is a lot of transgender-related work, um, and over the years, I would say the transgender community did a very good job of, of pushing the lesbian and gay movement to broaden itself and to merge all of these uh, issues, cases, and, and uh, legal questions together um, so that now uh, it, it, it's hard. I can't really imagine how they could be separated. Um, obviously, and maybe Brian would want to say something about this, this has had political ramifications, and there have been, uh, at, at both the federal and state levels, it's not just where there have been uh, tough political questions that have been grappled with and different people in the community answer them in different ways about what would we settle for when and who is included and who is not. And New York State, for example, went one way and other states have sometimes looked at that and said, we don't want to have that battle for the rest of our lives. It's very difficult to come back, not impossible. And we've seen Connecticut, for example, just last week or the week before, mm -hmm. weeks are a little merged mm -hmm. here, uh, it has sort of brought the uh, transgender protections uh, in line with uh, sexual orientation protections. Um, but more and more, I think what we're seeing in the, in the sort of organized political and legal community is an unwillingness to separate out, uh, although sometimes that means it is a longer process, it takes more education, it is a harder sell uh, to either lawmakers or to judges. Uh, and requires more time and energy before things change. So I don't yeah, know if that answers it, but. I'll add to that on, on, I think Kevin is right when he says that as a matter of both litigation and legislative strategy, um, the uh, bisexual status as compared to lesbian or gay status has not been a particular focus of attention because it's generally the case that whatever legislation or whatever legal principles are contested, they will apply in equal measure to a bisexual person as they would to a gay or lesbian person. As a movement matter, I think that the under, uh, the lack of proper attention to bisexual people and to the, the, what is distinct about bisexual identity is a very important issue. And, um, you know, Gary Gates and the Williams Institute have recently published some important uh, 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 sort of comprehensive overviews of the best available survey data on how people uh, self-identify with respect to LGBT identity. And one of the most important, I think, uh, results of their view of the survey literature <coughs> is that a very large percentage of the people who identify as LGBT identify as bisexual. And uh, the numbers are larger with respect to women, but they're still quite large with respect to men. And I think that there is often an attitude towards sexuality in these discussions where if you're a man and you have sex with a man and have an interest in having sex with men uh, even only sometimes, then that is that defines you as being gay for purposes of discussion. And if you're a woman, then your sexuality just doesn't matter as much, uh, which I think t seems to be the attitude of a lot of public policy makers and a lot <laughs> of people who want to tend to steer these discussions. And I think that focusing on the reality of bisexual identity and bisexual experience is important both because it reflects what people are telling us about their own experience and self-identification, and also because I think it is one of the ways that we can get at a more properly respectful and, and uh, discussion and discussion characterized by greater parity when it comes to male and female sexual experiences, which I think is we're better at than we used to be as a movement, but I think is still an area of great uh, 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 lack when it comes to the, the sort of cultural and organizational treatment of 
of sexual and family experience. Can, can, I, I, can, I, can I add one thing? When I spoke earlier about HIV, I actually used the term men who have sex with men, right. with men MSM. I, I think in the HIV world, there is a much greater understanding of the Absolutely. I don't know, variety of, of human sexuality, and that is why that phrase is used. But it's never used on the LGBT side, right. very, very rarely. So, uh, so that is a distinction there, but it, it needs to be dealt with uh, in terms of HIV prevention or just recognizing how the epidemic actually lives and works. Um, and, and that was created, those terms, to deal with the fact that we're talking about <coughs> men who may be exclusively gay and men who may be bisexual. Um, so, yeah. let's throw that in. Uh, yes, sir. I've got the mics. Yeah, I'm sorry about the logistics here. Uh, that, that makes a lot more sense. We'll pass them around. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could uh, address a little bit uh, uh, about strategic civil rights litigation in the gay rights movement. It's a, the history of gay rights in America has, uh, has a strong component of strategic civil rights litigation led by some of the major organizations. Um, the, in the marriage context, it's been a little bit different, a little bit more entrepreneurial. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the balance between uh, the civil rights in the civil rights litigation for gay rights, the balance between sort of the strategic vision of uh, the main organizations that are pushing litigation and uh, the more entrepreneurial lawyering that's happening out there, um, uh, especially in the marriage cases. Great. Who wants to tackle that? Evan? Yeah. Well, my answer would be that it really has been a mix of, of both. I mean, and, and Nancy described some of it with regard to the parenting and family situation. We all can talk about cases that happened because people found themselves in horrible situations and had to fight to protect themselves, their loved ones, to claim their equality and inclusion. And some of those cases were not strategically chosen by the very small at one time, now growing and robust but still under-resourced uh, movement organizations. Um, and then many, much, many of the developments and many of the historic strides forward that we celebrate have come from carefully thought out, well-constructed, chosen cases that are still about real people facing real injustices but that are more strategically thought out in terms of the larger landscape and vision and really has been a mix of both. The Hawaii case is the case that launched the global movement we are still in to end the exclusion from marriage. And it has helped lead to five states plus the District of Columbia as of today and uh, 12 countries on four continents where gay people now can participate in the freedom to marry. But the Hawaii case, although originally bruited about amongst the very small number of small groups then, uh, ultimately was initiated by couples. And the groups then came in, particularly Lambda Legal, and took it forward. And, and I think even most importantly, took a case and shaped it into a broad, multifaceted strategy to try to make sure that our political, or, our political organizing and our public education and all the other methodologies of social change, as Dr. King put it, are coupled to litigation, that it's not just left to the courts and to the lawyers. And I, that, more than anything, is what I think the legal groups and the groups like Freedom to Marry and others who have worked together to try to be strategic around opportunities and challenges have brought, that it's not just about a case. It's not just about a, a, a story or a couple. It's got to be folded into a much more multifaceted strategy. And I would also add that both approaches, if you want to call them that, have brought great successes. And some, and some serious stumbles. The, you know, the case books are littered with, uh, holding, holding alluded to the, the footnote in the Washington case. Many of those cases were, were cases that the legal groups and others counseled against. And they resulted in exactly what the legal groups feared at the time. Terrible precedents that didn't advance the ball for anyone, however burning it was to the couple. And, Yet, you can also point to some examples where people ignored the advice or didn't even know there was advice to be sought <laughs> and went ahead and brought a case, and that case happened to do well. And there are cases that we've brought that did not deliver what we wanted. But in general, the strides that we celebrate, I think, are a tribute to an effort to be A, strategic, and B, multifaceted in the way we all need to think about social change as we've been discussing on the panel all along. It's not just about what happens in the courtroom. 
if winning formal legal equality, or more importantly, freedom, equality, and inclusion, if winning that were just about having really good lawyers, choosing right cases, and writing smart briefs, we would have been done 40 years ago. It takes more than that to win. Could I add something to that? Yeah. The, um, because I want to say something about not just Lambda, but all the legal groups, and I'd like to do a little shout out here to Single A, GLAD, NCLR, and the ACLU, because we many of the cases that we've talked about uh, from the panel today uh, were cases that those groups have brought as well. Uh, we all struggle with the balance of, of between strategy and then the cases that come in that I call the, uh, the ones that fail the shocks the conscience test, and there are things that just have to be done whether we would have chosen to do them at the beginning or not, but because they happened and the facts are such and there is a public response and you just can't let certain things go by. And as Evan said, some of those are winners, some of those are losers, some of our strategy is winners, some of them are losers. But I think what has happened now uh, over the last couple of years, and you know, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, this is going to just uh, continue. Uh, apparently now everyone in America is a lawyer, and everyone in America is an expert on LGBT law. And so uh, with that happy set of circumstances, cases are being brought all over the place, uh, sometimes in consultation, frequently not. We learn a lot from the newspapers. Um, and newspapers. It's, you know, is it a bad thing? Well, some days I think it's a bad thing. Other days I think it's a great thing uh, because so much more is happening than our groups would be able to do on their own. The last thing I would say to this, just as a, um, just a fluke of the calendar, but next, uh, next Sunday is the eighth anniversary of uh, the Lawrence v. Texas decision. Um, which is, I think, you know, one of my best examples of a strategic mm -hmm. set of work that went on going back 25 years to when Bowers was lost. Paul Smith, who argued the case, is, is in the corner because he wouldn't come sit in the front of the room. <laughs> it is both the the I think the highlight because it was this, the Supreme Court decision of all Supreme Court decisions for us, uh, but also one that continues to be used and continues to be expanded on and grow. And um, so a lot has happened in those eight years. And if you think back to the 17 years before that, uh, I don't think anything better illustrates the changes that have taken place. So. And yeah, and let me also uh, say that once again, don't think that this set of considerations about uh, strategic thinking in a movement and strategic thinking around litigation is is kind of done in the more established areas of formal legal equality like for example race conscious uh, uh, race discrimination and race conscious legislation uh, you know the post Adirond world of compliance with respect to race conscious contracting programs is an area of immense importance it's not very sexy sounding but you know the the big organizations that focus on race issues and, and litigation and individual attorneys who specialize in this one of my closest friends in DC is a specialist in this area are every single day trying to figure out what cases are being are, might be brought and what record needs to be made and where what the circuits are doing and what the court is liable to be in interested enough to take. Uh, you can say the same thing about voting rights uh, cases. I mean, you know, this is not something, th this is not a set of considerations that somehow ends, right, once you achieve a certain milestone when it comes to the establishment of formal legal equality. So it is a sign, I think, of the maturation of the LGBT mm -hmm. rights movement that we can have much deeper and more involved conversations about these strategic questions. And there are more players out there than there used to be, and not everybody is, is coordinating with each other. but you know, that's just all the more indication that we need to be thinking about these questions because it doesn't stop. It just, it just morphs, right? Can, can, I, mean, can I just, can yeah, I just add, um, uh, no, nobody's mentioned, but I would think it's relevant here to your question, is that there is strategic decision making being made by our opponents as right. well. Right. And um, that then becomes uh, the basis for responses on our part. So I, I mentioned the, um, the focus on tying parentage to biology and rejecting um, any kind of parental claims that are for anyone who isn't a biological uh, parent. But for example, who knew that people opposing 
LGBT equality in marriage could be so subject to victimization that the Supreme Court would say, we're gonna prevent their testimony from being uh, presented as a videotape in the Perry trial, right? The argument of, uh, that prevented all of us from getting to view that trial was that the experts who were gonna testify against marriage equality would be harassed and victimized if their testimony were televised, essentially. And that's the basis on which the Supreme Court forbade the trial judge to allow the streaming of the trial. We have Catholic Charities uh, last week or the week before um, filing a lawsuit against the state of Illinois because uh, of Illinois civil union law. Catholic Charities does not want to have to place children for adoption in unmarried households, gay or straight, and unmarried, civil union means unmarried to them. So um, they are claiming the mantle of um, the, uh, their religious freedom right to decide that a child must go to a heterosexual married couple. There's a photographer in New Mexico who is claiming a religious freedom right to be exempt from state anti-discrimination law because she didn't want to photograph a same-sex commitment ceremony in New Mexico. And so this is strategic litigation um, that's turning the table on who it is who has been subject to historic discrimination in this country. And that is going on at the very same time that we talk about our own strategic litigation. And, and if I could just add to that, I, that is, I think, a really important point, and I think there are two meanings to it. One is to note that that kind of diversion argument or very competing view about the proper balance of non-discrimination and freedom in a society has always been a feature of civil rights movements, of women's equality movements, and so on. There always have been those who've stepped up to say, we should not have to serve those kinds of people. We should have a license to discriminate. We should be free to, uh, to not have to do what the law neutrally and I, rightly uh, says is the way in which we function together in the public sphere. And so there's always been an element of that. The other point, though, that I think is really powerful for us, and I think it's encouraging, though Nancy's absolutely right to flag this as something that very much shapes the landscape on which we are battling now, is to me it's a marker of how far we've come, that really the best dodge the opponents have now is that diversion and claiming the victim and harassment line of attack. It is a sign of the fact that they've lost the argument on gay. It used to be they could simply say, gay, these people are sick, these people are immoral, these people are dangerous, and it would be rubber stamped as, yes, that's right. They've lost that argument amongst most Americans, not everywhere, every time, but most. And they're losing the argument on marriage. They used to simply be able to say, we have to defend marriage. And that was taken as a given. Gays can't marry, or this is a threat. And we now know that the public's opinion on that and the weight of political opinion, even on both sides of the aisle, is beginning to shift dramatically on that. So they've lost the gay. They've lost the marriage. What they're left with now is pounding the table and diversions and dodges. That's the fault line we're dealing with in Albany right now. We'll see how well we're able to overcome it, and we'll keep fighting. And Nancy's point, though, that the terrain of battle is not always shaped by the choices and decisions and strategies and good ideas and sometimes bad ideas we may have, but by what others do. Let me see if I can possibly get two more questions in. This gentleman's been very patient. And, and uh, come on up to the mic, and I'll see if I can get him in and one more. Thanks. This was going to begin as a um, just a question, but now be a comment and a question spurred by the uh, comment about bisexuality. Make it quick, because um, <laughs> I do want to get two more. Sure, there is a relation between, uh, between the two. This idea that bisexuals uh, just just sort of don't come up. They're not, you know, that, that, that it's the courts and the media that are obscuring their existence. I just don't think is is is, is quite true. I, it seems to me I'm doing uh, a good deal of work on bisexuality and same sex marriage at the moment, and it seems to me that no one. Uh, erases their existence more than the LGBT advocacy 
organizations, sometimes quite uh, pointedly. I think that I, 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 I'm sure that there are some good or seemingly good uh, strategic reasons for that, which you know, we can uh, uh, talk about, it, which kind of leads to my uh, second question, uh, which is that Nancy mentioned the uh, Lucy and Cole decision from the, uh, from the Arkansas Supreme Court, where the, where the Supreme Court overturned uh, this, uh, this law passed by referendum prohibiting um, adoption and foster care by unmarried sexual cohabitants. And, 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 and that decision was based on the Arkansas, you know, on Arkansas's version of Lawrence, a case called Jedley versus Picado. My question is whether uh, such an argument has been uh, considered uh, in the same-sex marriage context. Uh, I mean, again, it's a civil law, it's statutory privilege, right? And it's impinging, arguably, the same uh, interest in sexual liberty. And if the, and, and, and if the advocates or, uh, or academics on this table have, have considered making such an argument, I wonder why they might not. Uh, and perhaps you can see why I see a connection between the question and the comment about bisexuality. Because I think that bisexuality doesn't only offer opportunities to think about uh, uh, differences between uh, the sexualities of, say, men versus women, but also just sort of sexual liberty in general. I think they pose that question in a way that our kind of equality-based arguments about gay men and lesbians very often don't. Um, whole name, do you want to weigh in on that? The analytical question about using liberty-based arguments? Well, um, folks on this panel could certainly correct me, but I, from what I understand, right, a lot of the uh, cases for same-sex marriage were litigation was selected strategically in for states where their constitutions had robust protections of privacy. Hawaii, for instance, right? Not only did they pass a um, um, an uh, uh, equal rights amendment which made Hawaii's constitution more protective of sex equality, but Hawaii's constitution also protects um, privacy explicitly, right? And that argument, I believe, was advanced in Hawaii. Going on right now, I think there's a very interesting ACLU case in Montana, because Montana has a um, marriage amendment, but the ACLU there is arguing that as a matter of the Montana Constitution, same-sex couples there should still have a right to some sort of comprehensive domestic partnership, right? And um, I believe one of the arguments that they're making is um, a privacy-based argument, um, not just based on Montana's um, constitution, but they're launching a pretty significant public education campaign that's based kind of on Montana's norms of um, freedom and uh, free spirit, free uh, spirited living. Thank you. Let me see if I can get just one more in. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. Sorry, I'd like to go for another hour. You understand, <laughs> but they're not going to let. Hi. Um, I just have a question for everyone on the panel. I think a big criticism within the movement is that where the, the movement has gone and where it's moving forward is not inclusive of the diversity within our movement and people of color, low income communities. And how do you see the movement moving forward being more inclusive of all the intersectionality of all these layers of discrimination within the movement and how that looks going forward? Great, so we've got about two minutes, so let me just let folks who want to respond to that question. <laughs> All right, let me instruct people to respond to that question. Nancy, do you want to jump in? Well, I'll, I'll say something um, brief, which is to say that um, I think that comes up specifically in areas where if we get formal equality through marriage recognition, there is um, disparate impacts going on that affect heterosexuals as well. And I'm thinking, for example, of the social security system where um, our social security system now privileges by far the single earner married couple, so the breadwinner uh, dependent spouse model. And uh, married couples who earn roughly the same amount of money are treated exactly the same way in our social security system as same sex couples. They're, they are essentially, they're putting more money in and getting less money out than that single wage earner gendered norm that we have inherited since 1939. Um, we need to be part of a movement that says, and there's quite a bit of research on how African American married heterosexual couples are discriminated against in the social security system because they put more money in and get less out because they're more likely to be closer to equal earners than a single breadwinner dependent spouse. Um, the, the economic reality is, um, uh, affects a lot of people and needs to be addressed and cannot be addressed if 
the argument that we're making entirely is on behalf of same-sex couples who mirror that same single wage earner to, and, uh, or primary wage earner um, a couple because they perhaps shouldn't get any more benefit than heterosexual couples who meet that norm do. So it's a, it's a, there's a lot of work to be done um, uh, looking at those kinds of issues. Yeah. I would just say that I think that all of the legal organizations that work on these issues look for and try to find a broad range of plaintiffs and issues. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into this. Who wants to use the courts? Who's willing to devote chunks of their life uh, to being named plaintiffs? Who gets recognized out of all of the people who actually are involved in cases, uh, who's seen by the community, who's seen by the media? Uh, for example, uh, military cases have a disproportionate impact of, on people of color in this country, and in fact, the military policy has a hugely disproportionate impact on African American women. Uh, but when you talk about the military, most mainstream audiences don't think of that as an intersectionality issue, a people of color issue, a women's issue. They think of it as another men's issue, uh, although it has very different impacts. So I think some of this is an ongoing struggle uh, for our organizations to find people and, and interact across the broad communities that make up our community. Uh, and then some of it is about just perception and how do you get people to recognize the full range of of who's involved and who is impacted by all of this. Yeah, Can I, I'll, I'm sorry, go ahead. Could I add that in terms of immigrant communities in the United States, one thing that I've tried to do with my scholarship is um, to work with Asian American groups to keep the Asian American immigrant community abreast of developments that are happening abroad in Asia, because there have been positive advances there. There have been huge advances in Latin America. I think for a lot of um, American immigrants, there's a question of reconciling their um, kind of diasporic identity with gay identity, right? And this idea is, is, are these like white issues? And can we reconcile gay, gay rights with Asian culture for existence? Well, it's, friend, it's helpful to remind people that Asian culture, Latin America, Latino culture um, are evolving just as laws in these parts of the world are evolving as well. I think a lot of times immigrants have sort of ossified notions of what it means to be <laughs> Latino or what it means to be um, uh, Taiwanese, for instance. But, you know, Taiwan has passed um, an employment discrimination law um, that is like an ENDA, whereas we haven't passed that yet. And I think it's helpful to remind immigrant communities of those developments um, to remind people that culture is not static. Uh, I think we have to wrap it up. Thank you very much. This has been a great